Hello and welcome to another episode of the V8 Supercars Fancast. My name is Kendall. I will be your host as always. And we just had the last round of the Endurance Cup season. Sorry. The Gold Coast 600. So, as always, let's talk about what happened, who won, who lost... And other such things. And we're going to start with the... Well, we're going to start with qualifying for um, race number 26 on the Saturday. So, qualifying was um, not super interesting on the Saturday or the Sunday, really. Um, There were some interesting results, though. Um... So we'll go through them now. In first place, Shane Van Gisbergen with a 110.1 and then three tenths behind him, Jamie Winkup in second with a 110.4. Shane was absolutely on fire this weekend with his car. He had he must have just had the correct setup because in all of the qualifying sessions and practice and everything. He was easily a few tenths ahead of the next person every single time. It was quite astonishing, <laughs> to be honest. Shame it didn't really translate into the race as well, um, as we'll get to. Um, but that's for when we get to it. Uh, David Reynolds in third for 110.42. Nothing in it between him and Jamie. Uh, Scott McLaughlin in fourth for 110.5. James Courtney also with a 110.5. Fabian Coulthard for 110.61. Chaz with a 110.65 in 7th. Michael Caruso in 8th for 110.67 with a very late uh, last minute attempt to get into the top 10, which he did well. Nick Perkat with a 110.70. And Cameron Waters also in uh, with a 1 minute 10.70. So barely in it between them as well um, in 10th place. So that's your top 10. And... Um, just like Bathurst, um, the Gold Coast has a um, top 10 shootout on both its uh, race days to determine the final order of the top 10 uh, qualifying positions. So we'll talk about those as well. But the rest of the field is determined by qualifying. So Rick Kelly, the first of the non-top 10 people, (laughs) as awkward as that sounds, Um, in 11th, Mark Winterbottom in 12th, Lee Holdsworth did really well actually on Saturday, Um, qualifying in 13th, Tim Slade in 14th, Will Davison in 15th, Craig Lowndes in 16th, who also got a five grid place penalty for impeding Richie Stanaway, Um, if you didn't see it... um, Craig came out of the pits. He was warming his tyres and um, Stanaway came up, I think it was just after the first chicane, so just after turn two, coming up to turn three. Um, Maybe it's turn four. I don't know. The one with the hairpin. Um, (laughs) They're warming up their tyres, coming up to there. And um, clearly, Lowndes wasn't told by his garage that there was someone coming on a flying lap because uh, Stanaway was coming and he (laughs) he just ran straight into the back of Lowndes. Um, ruined his car, ruined his lap, ruined everything. Um, Lowndes was out, of course, of qualifying as well. Plus, he got a five grid place penalty. So, if you're wondering why Lowndes started so far back on Saturday, um, he actually ended up starting in 21st because he had a five place penalty. Um, his last lap would have was ruined. He only set um, three laps. Sorry, he only set six laps, um, as opposed to everybody else who set. 10 to 12 laps-ish um, for qualifying. He only set six, and that's because his qualifying run was cut short by that. And he was also given a grid penalty, which put him back into 21st. Um, but um, he ended up having a really good race, as uh, as we'll get to. Of course, in the end, he also had a near incident with Coulthard as well on his first warm-up lap. Lowndes was out first, I believe, and he was on a hot lap while most of the other drivers were just warming their tyres up. Um, and he came across both the DJR cars, which were right next to each other, on the last corner, and he gets around McLaughlin, and um, it's just not a lot of room. Um, unfortunately, Coulthard was going around the little kink before the last corner, 
and Lowndes came up to the back of him into the braking zone and nearly rear-ended him. Um, he had to pull out of the lap, of course. Ruined his lap. Um, I thought it qualified as impeding another car. It was very close to an accident. Um, yeah, I'm not... I don't know. If it was me, um, that would have been slam dunk impeding a car. You get a, a three-place three place group penalty, something like that. Um uh, clearly, race control didn't agree with me though, because they didn't give him any penalty for that, um, and that's fine. You know, like it was a close one. Um, could have gone either way, really. It really just depends on how you see it. But to me, um, it did seem like impeding a car. But in the end, um, no one was hurt or anything. It didn't ruin anybody's cars or anything like that. It's just a shame that on Craig's first lap um, he couldn't finish a good time so that's another reason why he might have had a bit of a slower time than some of you might be expecting Um, because his car pace was definitely a lot better than 16th, that's for sure. Um, Anyway, Anton in 17th, Heimgartner in 18th, Garth Tander in 19th, Scott Pye in 20th. He had a really poor qualifying session which is strange compared to where his teammate ended up on Saturday. Um, James Golding in 21st, Jack LeBrock in 22nd, Simona in 23rd, Stanaway in 24th, of course, of his qualifying run being cut short, Todd Hazelwood in 25th, and Tim Blanchard in 26th, with the last car, Tim Blanchard, being a 111.6, 1.4 seconds slower than Van Gisbergen. So, quite a tight field, as always, just as we like it. Um, it's always good to see... It's always good to see a good, close qualifying session, and it was. Um, nothing else really of note happened, although I guess that was enough of note <laughs> to happen. Um, someone having someone running into the back of someone is enough carnage for qualifying. So let's just move straight into the top 10 shootout. And of course, we're going to go again in reverse order. In... 10th place, James Courtney with a time of zero. Zero, 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 because his time was disallowed for curb hopping. Um, if you don't know what curb hopping is, um, if you did watch Top 10 Shootout, um, I wouldn't blame you, because it was only really an issue in the Top 10 Shootout and qualifying. I will get to curb hopping at the end of the Top 10 Shootout results, um, because I have a lot I want to talk about. I want to talk about there. Um, yes, I will get to that. But James Courtney was done for curb hopping and he was out. He was the first car done for curb hopping. Um, so he was put automatically to the bottom of the 10. Shane Van Gisbergen in ninth with another time of zero because he was also done for curb hopping. So he started in ninth position. Um, Bit of a blow, bit of a shock, especially since he was leading the championship by 19 points coming into this race. Um, Not super great for him. Not super great for the championship leader. But everybody else got through fine. Um, Cameron Waters in 8th place with a 1 minute 11.39. Nick Perka in 7th with a 1 minute 10.97. Michael Caruso in 6th with a 1 minute 10.84. Chaz Moster in 5th with a 1 minute 10.78. Fabian Coulthard in 4th with a 1 minute 10.73. David Reynolds in 3rd with a 1 minute 10.58. Jamie Winkup in 2nd with a 1 minute 10.583. So David Reynolds had a 1 minute 10.584. And Jamie Winkup had a 1 minute 10.583. So incredibly close. And Scott McLaughlin had a 1 minute 10.374, putting him in 1st. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> oh. So, Scott McLaughlin started in first and Shane started in ninth. Not great for Shane. Um, as for curb hopping... Um, okay, so if you don't know how it works, um, I believe this is only used in Adelaide and in the Gold Coast, but... In both of those tracks, there is a pretty severe chicane section. Um, The Gold Coast in particular has a quite aggressive chicane. Um, Two of them, one at the start 
and one on the back straight. Um, I okay. I'll just explain how it works first. So how it works is that the the chicanes are built up. They have sausage curbs on them to stop people from cutting them and going too far over the curb. Um, they also have tire uh, a block of tires sitting on the uh, inside of the chicane to stop people from driving straight over the inside of the chicane and cutting the corner that way. Um, what they've also got, because they consider the amount of curb people are taking to be too much, they've installed a new system that automatically detects how far the car, how, how much curb the car is taking. And if they take too much, then their lap time in qualifying and in... Um, well, the lap time in general, no matter if it's a race or qualifying or whatever, um, is deleted. It's automatically deleted. It's just gone. The computer decides, it breaks the sensor. Like, it's it's a mechanical thing. It's a pretty simple thing. It's, is the car over the curb? If yes, delete time. That, that's as simple as it gets. Um, but there's no one looking over this system. There's no one who can get the lap time back because once it's deleted, it's deleted. Um <clears throat> oh, I keep coughing, sorry. Um, the problem... <sighs> okay, so the problem I have with this is that it doesn't... There are other places where people have used this, right? Um, for instance, in the recent... Uh, or oh, actually, it's happening right now. The, Form- the US Formula One Grand Prix, they're actually using it as well. And for there, they're determining when someone's gone too wide on a track. In other words, when they've put all four wheels off the track, it automatically dings them at a certain corner. It automatically dings them and their lap time is removed. That's how it works there. This is different because it's how much curb they're taking on the inside of a corner. So it's judging whether or not they cut a corner, not if they've run too wide off the track. This sounds fine, but the problem is that Drivers can't really see where the limit is because of the way the curbs are, especially at the Gold Coast. They've got those big sausage curbs on them. Drivers can't really tell where the limit is, um, which is why so many times were deleted from qualifying. It happened a lot in qualifying, especially on Saturday. Um, And that's why it happened. It happened in a shootout more than once, um, both on the Saturday and the Sunday, people's times were um, removed for curb hopping. Um, and it sort of robbed us of some good some good qualifying times. Like, I want to see drivers put in a qualifying lap. I don't want to see them pull up because they've curb hopped, so to speak. Um, and honestly, I think there should be more easy visual cue for a driver like the tire bundles being there and the sausage curves being there um the sausage curve is the giant raised rounded curb to stop drivers from driving straight over the 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 curb on the corner um they should be there to stop people from corner cutting anyway The, the the tire bundle being there is a physical limit to how far over they can drive if drivers are driving as as close to the tyre bundle as possible without taking it out, because if they do take it out, their car will be damaged and they won't be able to race anymore, then that should be allowed, shouldn't it? Like, isn't that why the tyre bundle is there? To stop people from cutting the corner? And if they're not hitting the tyre bundle, they're not cutting the corner. Full stop. That should be it, right? And if you think that people are getting too close to the curb... Why not just move the tire bundle forward? Because that would give the drivers a more visible representation of how close they're getting. You know, I think it's just... I don't think it's good for us to watch. Um, And what is defined as a curb hop, in inverted commas, is very, very loose. I couldn't really get a proper understanding of how far a car had to be over the curb in order for them to be disqualified. Even comparing laps that were fine, so someone went through the corner, didn't get pinged, versus someone who did go through the corner and got pinged, even comparing the images side by side, there was often barely a difference um, in them. Um, 
it's just it's just frustrating to watch a qualifying session and have a lap, a lap be removed, especially in especially in the top ten shootout when they get one try at it. It's just frustrating. I just want to see them. I just want to see them do their best. Um, and I just think moving the tire barrier, moving the tire bundle forward a little bit more. Um, moving the tire bundle forward a bit more is 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 better. I think removing someone's lap time is too harsh a punishment for something that isn't punished during the race. There was plenty of people who were given bad sportsmanship flags during the race for curb hopping too much. It happened a lot. Um, and supposedly they were only given this bad sportsmanship flag had they been curb hopping multiple times already during the race. So the lap time is deleted during the race, but that doesn't matter during the race if your lap time is deleted. It's not important. There's no points for setting the fastest lap in supercars. So there's no real reason why that should matter. You could curb hop all day long and have all your lap times deleted and it it wouldn't matter. It's where you physically finish the race. That's important. So apparently they were letting them do it multiple times before they gave them any kind of warning. And a bad sportsmanship flag just means don't do it again or we'll give you a drive through penalty. Um, so a couple of people did get bad sportsmanship bad sportsmanship flags for, uh, for curb hopping, but no one got actually penalised for it. And supposedly, according to the commentary, according to Scafie and Crofty, um, Crompty, not Crofty, <coughs> sorry Crofty, um, according to them... Um, they had to be be doing it consistently throughout the race in order to be given a bad sportsmanship flag. What is the point of punishing someone so harshly in qualifying and then not doing anything about it in the race if it's supposedly corner cutting and it's so bad? You know, they don't want to move the tire bundle forward because they don't see it as an endemic problem enough to damage a car as punishment for corner cutting the chicane. But they do think it's fine for someone like Shane or James Courtney who, realistically. James took a 10-place grid penalty because his lap was deleted. He could have come first. He took a 10-place a grid penalty for being very mildly over the line on a chicane. And so did Shane. He took a 9-place grid penalty because he could have been in first. I know he, he neither of their laps were probably going to be in first, but they could have been in first. And now he won't know where they would have been. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm coughing so much. Oh, sorry about that. I'm trying to stop it. Doesn't make for good listening if I'm coughing all the time. Um, it is what it is, though. Um, the drivers have complained about it before. Um, they've been using it since 2014. Um, and I just... I just wish that there was more of a visual indicator. Um for cars about how close they can actually get because I want to see good, tight qualifying sessions. I don't want to see people's lap times deleted. That's not fun. So, um, anyway, we'll go into the race results now. And, well, who won, who lost? Chaz Mostert put in a great performance to come in first place for the day. After 102 laps, he crossed the finish line in first. And if you're wondering why I'm being so... uh, Not talking very much, it's because I'm trying to get my notes up here. (laughs) Um, So Chaz Mostert and James Moffat won, who have very similar last names. Um, And they drove a very good race, uh, very dominant, especially towards the end. Um, and it's great to see Tickford doing well again, you know, it's great to see their cars up there. It's a shame that it's right at the end of the year, just before the Mustangs are going to come in next year, but (laughs) it's better than nothing. Um, Craig Lowndes and Stephen Richards came in second of another brilliant drive. James Courtney and Jack Perkins, surprisingly, managed to end up in third. I was actually really shocked that they came out with... They must have had the best fuel economy because they pitted so early, undercutted everybody, and apparently they didn't even need to save fuel. So I don't know what they're doing with those cars, but they've just got the best fuel economy. Um, David Reynolds and Luke Yildon in fourth, not able to get around James Courtney. 
Um, Scott McLaughlin and Alexander Prema in fifth, who faded a bit during the end of the race there. Nick Perker and Macaulay Jones in sixth. Great great drive from Macaulay Jones. I've been quite impressed with him um, and his appearances in supercars this year. Um, obviously, he hasn't done super well as a wild card in his own car, but when he's been co-driving one of the main driver's cars, he's done a really good job. He's, I've been Him and Will Brown, I think, are two to keep an eye on if they ever um, if they ever enter the main series. I don't know if they do. Macaulay Jones looks like he will if there's an opening um, in BJR. It looks like he'll come through. But um, Will Brown, I was really impressed with him at Bathurst and here as well. He did really well. Um, so, uh, despite a bit of an incident on the Saturday, um, he did do really well. So, um, I was really impressed with them. Really impressed with them. Uh, Mark Winterbottom and Dean Canto in seventh. Good job from Mark Winterbottom, actually, to finish where he did. Cameron Waters and David Russell in eighth. Garth Tanner and Chris Piffer in ninth. Garth did really well as well. Some great drives in here. And here's the one that decided the swing of the championship. Shane Van Gisbergen and Earl Bamber in tenth place. Meaning that the championship swung back to Scott McLaughlin by 14 points. So after this race... Scott McLaughlin, five point five positions up from Shane, um, finished in finished in the race ahead of the champion. Okay, finished the race. I'm going to do it again. Finished the race in the lead of the championship. Great, great drive. And you might be asking, why did Shane finish in tenth spot? That's really far down. Also, you haven't said Wing Cup and where he's finished yet. He's not in the top ten. No, he's not in the top 10, um, because, <clears throat> Ooh. all right, so Dumbrell was driving uh, right at the start of the race, made a pass on Prema, um, who was, of course, in McLaughlin's car, so Dumbrell was driving for Wing Cup, Prema's driving for McLaughlin. Um, Dumbrell made a pass on Prema's car, Oh, I don't remember the turn number, but um, it's a corner that is very hard to overtake on, admittedly, and it wasn't quite there. Um, Prema could have opened up the steering a bit. Wing Cup could have could have slow, you know, could have made the corner a bit. I don't think he really understood, to be honest. I think Prema kind of drove into him a bit, but he could have been a bit further down the inside. He could have made the move a bit more. Um, I don't know, on <laughs> for lack of a better word. Um, and he just ended up hitting him into the wall. Didn't do any damage, obviously, because he finished in fifth. Um, so that was the first thing that happened. It dropped him a few places, and that moved Dumbrell up into first. Prema dropped back into fourth or fifth. Um, and then they continued. No penalty was given, um, which I kind of agree with. I don't think there was any problem with that. Um, I do think it was a racing incident. Prema could have opened up the steering pretty easily. And I think Wing Cup was... Wing Cup. Dumbrell was pretty much there. Like, he, he didn't even dive bomb him. He was sort of already alongside him, kind of, and just didn't really have anywhere to go but just to stay up the inside of him. Um, so, if it had been a dive bomb, um, for sure, Dumbrell should have been penalised. It wasn't, though. He was sort of there the whole time. <laughs> he just got a good drive out of the last corner and uh, was just sort of um, had was sort of like one quarter up, not a not half a car length, he was sort of one quarter of a car length up against Prema, and he didn't really gain under braking. He didn't understeer into him at all. He just went around the corner. Prema kind of shut the door on him because he didn't think he he was there or he didn't look or whatever, um, and Prema went into the wall. Um, unfortunate, but I agree that it was a racing incident, but... Why did Wing Cup finish so far down if he wasn't penalised? Well, Will Brown actually had an accident and brought out the safety car. Um, very scary accident too. If you look at his onboards, it's quite terrifying because Stanaway... Um, well, not Stanaway. Ooh, who was it? Who was it? Steve Owen. Steve Owen driving Stanaway's, Stanaway's car. Um, tried to make a gap that wasn't there. Um, everyone else was going to the left of Will Brown's car and Stanaway tried to go for the right and didn't make it and ran straight into him, lost a wheel. Um, so they were both out of the race. Um, but Will Brown actually hit the wall and spun and it was facing the oncoming cars. And it's quite scary from his onboard because um, suddenly um, all these cars are going around him to the right 
far away from him and suddenly one of them just comes straight at him <laughs> and hits him um, and you can see his eyes like just oh he, there's one of, of his face and you can see him brace um yeah that one's like, that's quite scary to look at actually i didn't like that one very much <laughs> um but it is fascinating to see what they how they react when they're in a crash like that the drivers um but uh, it brought out the safety car on lap. I'm not sure what lap it was. Hold on while I consult my notes. Lap 23, um, which was good news for Craig Lowndes because pretty much everybody else had their co-drivers drive first except for Lowndes, who was the main a main driver driving in the co-driver stint, unofficial co-driver stint. He'd made a bunch of space and then safety car came out. He came in, swapped for Richards and then effectively um was able to get um able to have able to have the main driver drive during the co-driver stint and then also put the co-driver in and have him drive with all the other co-drivers as well so he got all the advantage and none of the drawback um so it was a really good effort <clears throat> from them uh, the safety car came at just the right time and that's what enabled it's partly why they were able to uh get so far up uh when they did but, um, what that caused was a huge rush into pit lane. So, at the time, Coulthard was ahead of McLaughlin, and Winkup was ahead of, not Winkup, okay, hold on, I'll take it back. Co-drivers were driving, so Dalberto in Coulthard's car was ahead of Prema in McLaughlin's car, and Dumbrell in Winkup's car was ahead of Earl Bamba in Shane Van Gisbergen's car. Um... The gaps between Dumbrell and Bamba, though, were significantly larger than the gaps between um, uh, Prema and Dalberto. Um, so, Prema was looking to get um, held up by uh, Dalberto's stop, but Dumbrell's should not have held up Bamba's stop. Um, so, what they ended up doing is DJR made the correct decision, because it's a championship fight now, right at that time of the season where they sacrificed Alberto's stop, short field him massively in order to get um, him out before Prema came in, which they did successfully, very smoothly. Um, excellent job from them. And Dumbrell's stop could not have gone worse. They let him go before Bamba showed up. He stalled the car for quite a while. When he came out, he ran straight into the side of... Um, uh, James Moffat, who was driving Chaz Mostert's car, unsafe pit release all day. Not even an argument there. Um, and then Bamba came in, they filled him up, put new tires on him, and he was released also into traffic. And Gary Jacobson, driving Rick Kelly's car, had to put on the brakes to avoid him, which was also deemed an unsafe release. And he was given a drive through penalty as well as Dumbrell. The Dumbrell one, drive through penalty all day. All day. Easy as you like. That's just... There's no question about that one. He ran straight into Mos, uh, into Moffat. Instant drive through penalty. You know? Um, I don't really agree with the Earl Bamber one. Um, there wasn't any contact. Yeah, and they're not meant to break for the cars that are coming out. Um, but... If there hadn't been contradictory incidents like this where they'd gone the other direction, I wouldn't be questioning it. But I just I can't help but think back to the bend when uh, Garth Tander was released in front of Andre Heimgartner and Heimgartner literally ran into the back of him and took himself out of the race by running into the back of Garth Tander who was released in front of him because he couldn't break in time. Um, and no penalty was given to Garth Tander for an unsafe release. And I've never quite understood why, because it was very clearly an unsafe release, unless Heimgartner was somehow speeding in pit lane, which is impossible because they have a pit limiter, electronically limits their car to a certain speed. Um, it shouldn't have been possible for him to run into the back of Garth Tander unless Garth, unless Garth Tander was released ahead of Heimgartner in a way that Heimgartner would have had to break very severely as well, because he took him out of the race with that damage. Um... And yeah, he hit him and he shouldn't have hit him, you know? And if the same rule applies here, 
um, if um, Jacobson didn't break, he would have hit Bamba. You know, like it doesn't. <laughs> if a similar incident has happened, like can't we be a little bit consistent? You know, um, if it was me, yes, it was an unsafe release. I think it was an unsafe release. But the fact that they haven't been quite consistent this year with them, it's just. <laughs> I just want some consistency with our results. I believe it was an unsafe release. I don't disagree with the call. Um, But compared to some of the things they've deemed not unsafe, um, it was fine, basically. So in context with the other calls they've made, it wasn't really a big deal. Um, In isolation, it was an unsafe release, I think. Um, Just a little bit more consistency would be nice. Otherwise, they've been pretty consistent this year. I don't have too many complaints about the calls that they've made. But... um, Yeah, just just a little bit more consistency, thank you. Would be nice. Um, anyway, back to the results, because I never finished. Um, in 11th, behind uh, Shane, was Coulthard and Alberto. In 12th, uh, Will Davison and Alex Davison. Pretty good drive from them. Scott Pye and Warren Luff in 13th. Jamie Winkup and Paul Dumbrell in 14th. It sort of stalled a bit through the field. I don't really know why, actually. Um, Shane managed to slice his way through many cars that Jamie didn't really seem to be able to get past. Um, But they did use team orders to swap them around, which, again, was the correct call. Um, Shane and Jamie, I mean. um, Shane's fighting for the championship. Jamie is technically still in the championship points-wise, but it's probably not going to win it unless it takes, you know, unless it's some kind of miracle at this stage. Um... Lee Holdsworth and Jason Brighton, 15th. Jack LeBrock and Jonathan Webb in 16th. Tim Blanchard and Dale Wood, pretty good drive from them, 17th. Simona and... Sorry. Simona Di Silvestro and Alex Rulo in 18th. Andre Heimgarten and Aaron Russell in 19th. Todd Hazelwood and Bryce Fullwood in 20th. And Tim Slade and Ash Walsh in 21st after they had a wheel fall off their car. Rick Kelly and Gary Jacobson in 22nd. Michael Crusoe and Dean Fiore in 23rd. James Golding and Richard Muscat in 24th. And not classified, Will Brown and Steve Owen. And also Anton Di Pasquale and... <laughs> Will Brown, Anton Di Pasquale and um, Will Owen and Steve Owen. And Richie Stanaway. Um not classified for their incidents um and if you're wondering why in particular any of those cars are out um i don't actually know what happened to james golding and rick kelly but uh, michael caruso dropped a cylinder they had to fix that um and tim slade was also given a drive-through penalty because for not for an unsafe pit release and they were also fined because they attached the wheel which fell off and then as the rim hit the ground it smashed the brake rotor and it fell off too <laughs> so that was a, a loose brake rotor and a wheel rolling around pit lane for a bit um which a wheel flying off the car is a fine all day you know you can't have that wheels have to be attached you don't want them driving at 200 kilometers an hour with a wheel flying off hitting someone in the head <coughs> oh my gosh terrible with the coughing really gotta stop um Never seen a brake rotor fall off a car like that before, but I think it was just the rim hitting the ground, shattering the brake rotor. So he was given a drive through penalty and their team was fined. Um, but that was kind of it for uh, racing incidents. Um, aside for, I guess, <laughs> it. Um, the championship leader was given a drive through penalty and double stacked awfully. Um, so there was a bit of drama. Um but Shane did manage to put in a fantastic drive. So um, when Jamie and Shane got in their cars, they were in 21st and 22nd, I believe. Um, and both of them sliced their way through the field until Jamie got to the back of Scott Pye, and then he just could not, for the life of him, get past. Um, Shane eventually caught up to Jamie. They let Shane pass. They used team orders to let Shane pass. Shane worked on the back of Scott Pye until he let him through. Until he got through, sorry. Um... Will Davison, he got past fairly easily. He also got past... Oh, I do remember what happened to Rick Kelly now, actually. He was just about... He was trying to get past Rick Kelly, and then Rick Kelly had a... Steering problem? 
I'm not sure if it was a power steering failure or something similar, but they had to uh, garage him right at the end of the race. So Shane got around him for free, basically. Um, and then he got around Coulthard as well towards the end, um, and he finished in 10th. So Shane put in a really good drive towards the end to get up to where he did. He made up 11 positions. Um, so excellent, excellent driving from him, especially on Scott Pye. He had a great battle with him for a long time. Um, it was great stuff to watch. Um, aside from that, though, um, the only other thing I really want to talk about is that the pit lane exit is really bad. <laughs> um, if you didn't see it, the pit lane exit actually... The first corner on the Gold Coast is, is the chicane, and uh, it's a left followed by a right chicane. Um, and the pit lane actually exits after corner after turn one of the chicane into turn two, so on the outside of turn two, um, right in the path of oncoming cars. They, they, if a car comes out side by side, the car going through the chicane has to cut the corner or they risk just running straight into the car that's exiting pit lane. That's ridiculous. Why did they design pit lane like that? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It's so dangerous. Um, yeah, it's just an accident's going to happen there sometime. Someday there's going to be an accident. Um, it's gonna happen, you know. Like it's just it's just a ridiculous spot to put it. I don't know why they don't just let them, because the pit actually exits onto the straight, and they have to stay within the lines until the first corner. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why they don't just let them rejoin the circuit on the straight <laughs> instead of making them go past the first corner. But that's how they've done it, and I think it's ridiculous. Um. There's going to be an accident there someday because a bunch of cars are fighting for position and then someone comes out of the pits at the same time. It's going to happen. I'm calling it right now um, because it's an absolutely ridiculous pit exit. It should not be like that at all. Um, I had a, It's not the only track this year that I've had a problem with the pit with the pit exits and entries. Um, Barbagello was really bad for pit entry as well because the cars going into the pits had to make a sharper turn. And therefore, people were re-ending, re-ending them because they were expecting them not to break as much. Um, it was just, it was just a bit, it was just ridiculous. There's been some ridiculous pit pit lane lines being drawn. Um, that's definitely one that I would change though, because they come out full speed at a pit lane into a chicane, and there's, I think if there's another car there, they're going to run into them. It's going to happen. Um, um, but aside from that, I don't really have anything else that uh, really happened in the race. To be honest, it's kind of... Um, usually the Gold Coast is quite a chaotic race due to those chicanes. Um, someone usually makes a mistake, and Will Brown did. Um, but he was the only one. Normally there's a few more than that. Um, uh, it normally can be quite reliable for chaos, the Gold Coast. But not so. Not so this time. So let's move into the Sunday events. The Gold Coast race being made up of two... 300 kilometer races which in and of itself is a bit weird it's not really an endurance race if it's just one 300 kilometer race twice you know there's not even like one code one driver could do that they don't need the co-drivers for this race and they are actually going to change it for next year i'll get into that in the new section after we go through the results for the sunday race so qualifying Shane Van Gisbergen once again with a 1 minute 10.19, followed by Scott McLaughlin with a 1 minute 10.32. So Shane, again, very dominant in qualifying. Jamie Winkup in third of a 1 minute 10.44444, which is amazing. <laughs> um, Craig Lowndes in fourth of a 1 minute 10.66. Chaz Mostert with a 1 minute 10.73 in fifth. James Courtney in sixth of a 1 minute 10.75 in sixth. I think I already said that. Uh, Scott Pye in 7th for 1 minute 10.77. David Reynolds in 8th for 1 minute 10.774. Uh, Tim Slade in 9th for 1 minute 10.88. And Cameron Waters in... Wait. Tim Slade in 9th. I think I said that. I don't remember anymore. You can tell me. Uh, <laughs> tell me in the comments if I got it right. Um, and Cameron Waters in 10th with a 1 minute 10.98. Cameron Waters, again, just making it into the top 10 because Fabian Coulthard had a 1 minute 10.98. Four, so very close that uh, tenth spot. But Cameron Waters made it once again, and again, there's another top ten shootout on the Sunday. So those are your top ten shootout participants. But the rest of the field is decided by qualifying, with Fabian Coulthard, like I said, being the best of the rest in eleventh, 
Lee Holdsworth, once again, pretty good drive in qualifying with a 12th spot. Nick Perkett in 13th, Mark Winterbottom in 14th, Tender in 15th, Caruso in 16th, Pasquale in 17th, Rick Kelly in 18th, James Golding in 19th, Heimgartner in 20th, Will Davison 21st, Blanchard in 22nd, Stanaway in 23rd, Hazelwood in 24th, Silvestro in 25th, and Jack LeBrock. Not classified for causing a red flag, which I thought was a bit harsh. He actually went off the runoff area at, I think, turn four, the first hairpin. Um, and he just struggled to get his car turned around, I think. He couldn't. He didn't seem to be able to spin it. Um, he just kind of did a, a billion point turn until they eventually red flagged the session to let him get out. Um, which I thought was a bit harsh because his car was still working and he was still moving it around. He just couldn't get out of the runoff area. So he's... Uh, time, of course, wasn't classified for causing a red flag. Um, if you didn't know, if you cause a red flag in a session or in qualifying, you are eliminated from qualifying. So he unfortunately started from the back of the grid for that, um, and he was on his warm-up lap, I think. Um, so he didn't even get to set a time, not even in warm-up. Um, otherwise, not a big deal in qualifying. Um, Shane, once again, showing his pace. He's... Uh, by far and away the fastest car. Uh, I mean, he only set five laps. Um, sorry, six laps, where everybody else once again did 10 to 12 laps um, of qualifying. He only did six. So he clearly was dialed into that track like you wouldn't believe. Um, On to the shootout. And once again, we'll go in reverse order just to maintain the uh, tension for as long as possible. Uh, Tim Slade. Not classified for curb hopping. Um, once again, same corner. I think it's turn nine on the back chicane. Got most people was that turn. Um, it's at turn nine and turn two. The other chicane on the front straight was where they were monitoring. Um, and that's where turn nine was pretty much the lion's share of where it happened. Um, Jamie Winkup in ninth with, again, not classified time for curb hopping. Except this one, I think, was legitimate because he came down the front straight at the, right at the start of his lap. Um, had a huge moment under brakes. Um, I think his car, his tires, he locked his tires coming down the bumps, um, which unsettled his car. He oversteered pretty big into the first corner, which completely compromised him for the next corner in the chicane, and he just went straight over the curb. Um, um, Yeah, so he was done for that, and his lap was pretty much ruined already. Um, So I don't think he was too fussed by that. Um... But it still would have been nice again to see him actually finish the lap and try and scrape it together. And in 8th place, Scott McLaughlin, also with a not classified time, the complete reverse of what happened yesterday with Scott McLaughlin curb hopping and having his lap deleted and starting at the back of the grid whilst Shane Van Gisbergen managed to get away with not curb hopping this time. Cameron Waters in 7th with a 1 minute 11.0. James Courtney in 6th with a 1 minute 10.8. Scott Pye in 5th with a 1 minute 10.7. Craig Lowndes in 4th with a 1 minute 10.73. Shane Gisbergen in 3rd with a 1 minute 10.71. Chaz Moster in 2nd with a 1 minute 10.70. And David Reynolds in 1st with a 1 minute 10.69. Extremely close qualifying session. It was so close in the top 10 shootout with the top 3 cars being separated by only... Um, one one hundredth of a second, um, more or less, which is just you know so close. It was so good to watch, and even Lowndes was in there. He's uh he's only um three hundredths of a second down, so very close qualifying session. Um, with Cameron Waters only being three tenths slower than David Reynolds, so extremely close top ten shootout. It was great to watch. Um, not so great that of all the curb strikes. Um, not a huge fan of that, as I've already said, but I won't go into that again. Um, you know how I feel about them. Um, so, how'd the race go? Good question. <laughs> um, the race was actually cancelled. Um, so they into about lap 35, I think. Um, the race was red flagged due to uh, conditions that are not fit for driving. Um, it absolutely poured down on the racetrack. The racetrack was extremely slippery. Um, Dumbrell ran into the wall. Um, lots of people ran into the wall because of Dumbrell running into the wall, etc., etc. 
They decided to red flag the race to see if conditions would improve. Unfortunately, the Gold Coast is not on a track. It's a street circuit. As such, they're on a pretty strict time limit. Um, I mean, yes and no. They're on a time limit because it's a street circuit. They're also on a time limit because the because Fox, the broadcaster, has other stuff they want to show. I and mean, that's, that's the nature of it, really. Um... So they have to finish by uh, 4.48 local time in Queensland. Um, and Or, if they don't finish by that time, if they don't finish the race by that time, it's uh, 4.48 plus one lap. But they have to be made at least 50% race distance to finish the race. But the stewards waived that race, the race, time, the race distance requirement um, under red flag conditions. But they went out again to see if they could go. They went out under safety car after a while, after being red flagged, and they determined that they wouldn't be able to go for a while, so they decided to can it anyway. So the race was scrubbed. No results, no points, nothing. So no race results, unusually. (laughs) Um, We did get to see some good racing Um, anyway. um, Moffat got away at the start pretty cleanly um and um bamba managed to get around yulden as well um there was a bit of chaos once the rain started coming down which is always lovely to see uh people scrambling for tires and all sorts of uh, rash decisions being made um alex rulo in uh simona's car went in extremely early for wet so i was super surprised um didn't really work out for them um but it doesn't matter because the race was scrubbed so <laughs> who cares um get a freebie on that one um, but this also means that in terms of the championship, well, it means a lot of things, um, nothing really, ch- nothing changed after Saturday. So Shane Van Gisbergen still 14 points down on Scott McLaughlin. And that's where things are now. There are, I think, four races to go. There's Pukekohe, which I believe is two races. And then there's Newcastle, which is also two, which I think is also two races. And that's it. That's the end of the championship. So we're getting right into it. Right at the end, and it's looking like it's going to be so close. It's going to be so close, just like it was last year. It's going to go right down to the last race, and I'm so excited for it. Um, I honestly don't know who's going to win at this point. It is just they are so even, these two guys. Um, Is anyone else within a shout? I don't think so. Um, Theoretically, it's still possible for David Reynolds to win in fifth. Um, Theoretically, I think there's... I think there's 700, 600 points up for grabs. I think. I mean, yeah, three times two is 600. So, yeah, it'd be 600 points. So, no, David Reynolds can't win mathematically. Um, The only people who can win at this point mathematically are Craig Lowndes, who's 443 points behind. Uh, Jimmy Winkup, who's 433 points behind. Shane May Gisbergen, who's 14 points down. And Scott McLaughlin, who's in first. Those are the only people who mathematically can win the championship at this point um and i don't think jamie or craig are going to are going to win mainly because uh triple a is going to be going all in on shane he's the most likely to win he, they're going to be told to move over and they were both um during uh during the saturday race jamie was told to let uh shane through as he was coming up through the field and during the sunday race uh craig was told to let shane through as well well Stephen richard was told to let earl bamber through but same thing. Um, and they did, which is fair enough. I mean, that's sort of what you do. You're a team, and when it's obvious that one of you is more likely to win the championship than the other, you sort of become the second driver for a bit. That's how it works, you know? And it's pretty standard stuff. Um, Coulthard's also doing that job as well for McLaughlin in the DJR team. But I will go through the rest of the championship positions. David Reynolds in fifth Chaz Mostert in six. David Reynolds has is six hundred eighty one points down. Then a huge gap back to Chaz Mostert in six with nine hundred and thirty points down. And then the rest: Fabian Coulthard, who's over a thousand points down, in seventh. Rick Kelly in eighth. Scott Pye in ninth. Nick Perker in tenth. Tim Slade, Garth Tander, Mark Winterbottom in thirteenth. Will Davison, James Courtney, Cameron Waters, Michael Caruso, Jack LeBrock, still the first of the rookies. Andre Heimgarten in nineteenth. Anton Di Pasquale in twentieth. James Golding in twenty first. Lee Holdsworth, Tim Blanchard, Simona in 24th, Stanaway in 25th, Hazelwood in 26th, 
and that's the end of the main drivers. All the co-drivers have points as well, but that's they're not going to win the championship or anything. So um, <clears throat> that's sort of not really a, a factor. Uh, as for the team championship points, Red Bull are winning with 6,259 points with 30 penalty points for losing that wheel at Bathurst on Jamie's car. DJR are in second, 537 points down. So again, it's really only between these two teams. Um, I do think that Red Bull will win the team championships pretty easily. Uh, I think, Jamie, if we're going to compare um, the second driver at this point in the championship, the one that's more likely to support the one that's most likely to win the championship. Um, Jamie Winkup and Fabian Coulthard are the second drivers and Shane and McLaughlin are the first drivers, let's say. No, not actually, but let's just say that for simplicity. Um, so Shane and McLaughlin, pretty even. Um, Jamie, better than Coulthard. That's just what I think. Um, so it only, that, that, you know, I'm pretty sure Red Bull's going to win the team championships from DJR. Um, Tickford are next with... Um, Winterbottom and Mostert, followed by BJR in fourth, Erebus in fifth, uh, Walkinshaw Andretti in sixth, uh, Nissan with Rick Kelly and Andre Hungarner in seventh, Gary Rogers Motorsport in eighth, Lowndes all by himself in ninth, um, Caruso and Simona in tenth, Waters and Stanaway in eleventh, uh, 23 Red in twelfth, Techno in 13th, Preston Hire, which is Lee Holdsworth in 14th, um, Blanchard in 15th, and Todd Hazelwood, Matt Stone Racing, I believe, in 16th place. And that's your championship battle. Now we'll go into the news. And the... So there's a few small things. Um, Moffat was almost banned from the Sunday race due to an altercation in the Carrera Cup where he uh, physically... I don't know. I think it's, there's no actual details of what actually happened, but um, supposedly there was a physical altercation between Moffat and uh, Glenn Wood in the Porsche Carrera Cup race. They had an incident during the race after which there was a few words exchanged and a few uh, fists thrown, I suppose. Um, he was fined $5,000 and has been banned from the final Carrera Cup race this year. Um, but he was cleared to race with Mostert on Sunday. Um, so they nearly had to pull in a different driver, Shay Davies, also from the um, Carrera Cup series, um, to partner... Um, they were going to have Shay Davies partner... Stanaway and Steve Owen, who's raced with Chaz Moster before, uh, partner with Chaz. Um, they didn't end up, end up having to do it, but he nearly managed... He, Shea nearly got his first go at a supercar. So that was interesting. Um, food for thought. Um, <laughs> I've never seen someone been banned from a final race before, but there you go. Um... Uh, in regards to the water cancelled race, um, water cancelled race, Van Gisbergen has said, has spoken up, and he wants more wet race flexibility. Um, basically, saying that the TV station and needs to be more flexible with when they can do things. Um, he says, quote, there were storm warnings from first thing this morning, so people should have maybe put the race forward. We have this conversation every time there's a time certain race. It ruins it for the fans, the drivers, everyone. The TV station we're on should be flexible like that. Um, he's right. He really is. And the people I do feel sorry for are the fans. They paid money to see a race and they didn't get to see it. And that's not anyone's fault. Um, but, yeah, the race could have been moved forward. Um... And, I mean, if they had moved it forward by about two hours, they would have missed the storm, you know? So, it's just it's just what it is. Um, unfortunately, not quite how the world works, um, especially since uh, Supercars is on Fox, which theoretically should be the most flexible station of them all. But there you go. Um, not really. <laughs> not really at all. Um, so... Unfortunately, I agree with Shane here 100%, and he's not the only person who echoed this 
sentiment. Craig Lowndes said similar things. Um, and so did um, Garth Tander. But unfortunately, that's the way things are right now. It's just, this is where we're at. So the race wasn't moved forward and we didn't get to see a race for that reason because there's no flexibility in timing. And I don't see it getting fixed. It's just a reality of, of uh, it's just a reality of television, really. So unless the unless they move to an entirely streaming platform, on supercars runs it itself. Um, I don't see that changing. Um, what else is there? Well, the boss of Boost, the boss of Boost Mobile wants to make his own supercars team. So he wants to separate himself from the Welkinshaw Andretti partnership that they're currently in, and he wants to run his own team, uh, similar to how Red Bull runs their own teams, um, especially in the Formula One. Um, so he said, um, Boost Mobile boss Pete, Peter Adderton um, has said, quote, uh, we want a team, we'd absolutely love a team. We're always going to be focused on the team side of it, the team aspect. For us, we want that fan engagement. Look at what Red Bull is doing. They're, they own their own events. They own and run their own Formula One team. At some point, for a brand like ours, we're going to think more like a manufacturer. When the cars are the same and you're literally bolting everybody else's parts on, as a brand, you can control that. You can control that experience. When I look at Formula One, even if I sponsored the McLaren team or the Mercedes team, it would always be the McLaren team or the Mercedes team. But the Red Bull team is called Red Bull team. As a brand, that starts to become... Like right now, it's Roll Control Andretti United Racing. I want Boost Mobile Racing. Um, he's got a point, um, but he's even said that he will do it from scratch if he has to, which is exciting. We could be getting a new team in the not-too-distant future if that is the case. Um, it also means that Roll Control Andretti will have to look for a new major sponsor because they are a pretty major sponsor. Um I'm sure they'll be able to find some. No, they have some pretty big backing between Walkinshaw and Andretti together. Um, so... Hopefully we see that um, as early as next year. It would be great to see a new team, new drivers. Always good to see more people. I want to go back to the days of old when there were uh, when there were fifty cars starting at Bathurst. <laughs> That's what I want. Um, it won't ever get that big again, but it'd be nice. You can dream. Um, so look out for that team in the future. And the last thing on here is that the Supercars 2019 calendar has been released. Um, I'm going to go over it now just briefly because there are a few major changes on here that you might notice and some plans for the future calendars as well. So the Adelaide 500 is the first round as always <clears throat> uh, starting on the weekend of March the 2nd and 3rd. Melbourne 400 is included once again on the Grand Prix weekend of the 16th and 17th of March. Uh, Tire Power Tasmania Super Print, Super Print, Super Sprint on the 6th and 7th of April. Phillip Island on the 13th and 14th of April. Um, Perth Super Night, so that's been moved from the Sydney Motorsport Park and has been moved to Perth for May 3rd and 4th. I think this is a good idea. Um, having it in the middle of the night in Sydney during winter meant it was really cold and the fans were cold, etc., etc. Having it in Perth um, means that... Um, It'll be a good temperature because it'll be May, so it won't. It shouldn't be freezing cold. Um, Perth's quite a hot place anyway, so I think that's a really good. I think that's a really good fit. Um, Winton in the on May twenty fifth, twenty sixth. Darwin on June fifteenth and sixteenth. Townsville for July sixth um, and seventh. Ipswich for the twenty seventh and twenty eighth of July. The Bend on the on August twenty fourth and twenty fifth. Auckland. On September 14th and 15th, followed by Bathurst 1000 on the 12th and 13th of October. That's right. There's no sand down here. It's been replaced or has been switched with the Auckland race because then it's the Gold Coast on the 26th and 27th of October and then the sand down 500 on November on November um, 9th and 10th with Newcastle last on November 23rd and 4th. So, um, the main reason why they've swapped around um, the New Zealand race and the Sandown race is because um, Sandown has always in, um, clashed with the NRL and AFL Grand Finals. 
Um, and I think this is a good idea. It's always been kind of awkward having one of the biggest races of the year clash with um, with some of the two two of the biggest sporting events in Australia. Um, so I think this is a good idea. What I don't like is that Bathurst is now first in the endurance races. So um, Sandown was always, or Sandown or Phillip Island before, were always kind of a test for the endurances to see how they would do with the new drivers and how they would fit in, give them a chance to try out race conditions before going to the big one. Now Bathurst is first. I don't... Obviously, it's not a terrible thing. Um, I don't quite like it. I'd like to have another endurance event before it just to... just to give them a chance to, like, you know, drive the supercars around in race conditions for a bit before we go to Bathurst. I want to see good racing at Bathurst. I don't want to see dumb mistakes... Um, and this is going to foster a few more dumb mistakes, I believe. Um, especially since the first time they will be racing a car in race conditions will be during the race at Bathurst. Um, so there you go. Um, but that's the calendar. Um, no huge shocks here. Just the fact that Tasmania has the night race, not Tasmania, Perth has the night race and Sandown and, um, New Zealand have been swapped. Um, in addition, you might notice that Sydney's not there. It's taking a break next year and will be back in 2020, apparently. Because in 2020, Supercars is going to go for a more summer-focused calendar. So what's going to happen is that they're looking to move the start of the season forward by almost two months and have Adelaide in January um, and work that around the Australian Open and the Bathurst 12-hour race, which is in February. So, uh, yeah, we're going to have potentially a more summer-focused calendar starting earlier in the year from 2020 onwards. So it's not just a one-time thing. Um, They're wanting to do this. um, They wanted to make it a permanent change. And basically the reasoning is to make it so that it avoids um, the NRL and AFL seasons. Um, Because I assume there's quite a bit of crossover between people who watch AFL and NRL versus the supercars. Um... So that's the plans going forward. Not sure how I feel about it. Um, It's already hot racing supercars and it's hot in Australia. So I kind of more would rather have it be in winter. um, Just for the sake of the drivers and keeping them cool and having them race at their best and that sort of thing. Um, So I'm not a huge fan of it. Not like it's going to be bad or anything. It definitely gives me something to do during summer. Um... But that's not until 2020 anyway. Um, It also means that at the end of 2019, the next season's going to start really early (laughs) because 2019 will be a normal season that ends in November and then potentially the next race will be two months later in January. So that'll be interesting to see as well. So we could get a lot of racing in between 2019 and 2020. Um, After that, it'll level out a bit, of course. But we could get a lot in that period. Um, And that's really all the news. Um, It's actually quite a bit this time around the new calendar is quite quite different so quite a bit of stuff to digest there um quite an interesting quite an interesting uh race we had uh with the second one being cancelled i haven't seen a cancelled race in supercars for a while but let's go into the next event so where is it you might be asking well it's in Auckland at Pukekohe, to be precise. Um, it's on the... I don't actually have the dates here. But it is in two weeks' time. Or a week's time. No, two weeks' time. Two weeks' time. It's in two weeks' time. <laughs> um, is first practice, um, with the race being on the Saturday, of course. Um, and the... Uh, Two races, sorry, with one race on the Saturday and uh, the Sunday race having a qualifying and a top 10 shootout followed by a race, of course. Um, So there'll be one top 10 shootout, two more races at Auckland and then two races at Newcastle. We're right at the end of the season. Shane is 14 points behind Scott McLaughlin. There's 600 points up for grabs in the next four races. It's going to be so close. You do not want to miss this one. Um, Please let me know who you think is going to win the championship. 
um, in the comments, of course, as always. Um, also, let me know what you think about the whole curb hopping thing. I'm legitimately interested in what other people think about it. Um, and um, just let me know about anything, you know? You've got, you've got a, you got a question for me, like, you know, whatever. Just let me know. Um, if you want me to do your homework, you know, fill in for you at work, that sort of thing, just let me know, you know? <laughs> um, but, um, uh, what was I going to say? I don't remember. Nah, well, probably wasn't important. Um, yeah, if you got any, uh, opinions about the curb hopping, um, any opinions about Dumbrell's move on Prema, um, in uh, race one or if you've got any thoughts about the rain and moving the race forward and being a bit more flexible um, please let me know or even just any, any opinions on Moffat being banned from the race um, I'd love to hear your Moffat based opinions I'd love to hear all your opinions um, let me know let me know who you think is going to win the championship of course there's four people who can win Shane, McLaughlin, Jamie, and Lowndes. I'd love to see Lowndes win the championship on his last full-time year. I don't think it's going to happen, but it would be so good um, if he did. But it's going to be close between Shane and Scott. I can't wait to see the next round. It's going to be so close between them. And I'll hear from... Well, I won't hear from you. You'll hear from me right after the Auckland race for the next episode of the supercars fan cast see you then 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 see you then